welcome to the Psychology Podcast, where we give you insights into the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity. I'm Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman, and in each episode, I have a conversation with a guest who will stimulate your mind and give you a greater understanding of yourself, others, and the world we live in. Hopefully, we'll also provide a glimpse into human possibility. Thanks for listening and enjoy the podcast. So today I'm really excited to have Catherine McLean on the podcast. Dr. McLean is a research scientist, teacher, and meditator. In her academic research at UC Davis and John Hopkins University, she studied how psychedelics and mindfulness meditation can promote beneficial, long-lasting changes in personality, well-being, and brain function. In the fall of 2015, she co-founded and began directing the Psychedelic Education and Continuing Care Program in New York where she has facilitated monthly integration groups for psychedelic users and training workshops for both clinicians and the public. She currently lives on an organic farm and is preparing to be a study therapist on the upcoming phase three trial of MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder. Hey, thanks so much for chatting with me today, Catherine. Yeah, you're welcome. As we were saying, this is my uh, last hurrah before my second child arrives on planet Earth. So it's a lovely way to end a nice period of work. Well, thank you so much. We're so honored that you are appearing on the podcast. And, you know, I haven't talked to you in four years, and I feel like we've both grown tremendously. I'd love to hear about your growth. I've definitely grown. When you met me in 2013, that was like one of my first talks I ever gave in public. And I was so shy and nervous. And I was literally shocked at the positive reception of it. And I gave it, and I think it was the right venue, right time, right place. I gave a talk on openness to experience at the Bioethics Forum. And I didn't know there was this whole world of people. That's the first time I like stepped outside and I gave this public talk and you were so incredibly warm and welcoming. So many, like Richie Davidson was, well, there's so many people there, Matthew Ricard, et cetera, Jim Fadiman, they'd embraced this research. And then I realized, wow, there is this world of researchers who actually care about this as well. So anyway, thank you, first of all, for being so encouraging in, so early in my career. Yeah, it's kind of amazing to think about how much everything has changed just in that four years. Absolutely, yeah. Because, you know, my openness finding with psilocybin was just kind of hanging out there as a lone, I don't know, like a lone star. It was just like, here it is. You know, no one's ever thought to see if psychedelics change personality, even though they obviously do. And then since then, it's like all their researchers have said, oh, maybe we should keep looking to see if this was just a one-off finding or if it's something that's reliable. And I would say, I don't know about Matthew Ricard, he was pretty anti-psychedelics, but everyone else was probably warm and open because we've taken drugs. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering about that. I met some, <laughs> I met some people at that, that conference that were looking at me and I was looking in their eyes and I was like, are you tripping right now? <laughs> right. I mean, to this day, that remains one of the not most warm and welcoming audiences I've ever. And it was good because it was one of my first talks too. And I, and I was so anxious, right? And to realize that people care about these topics. Yeah, definitely. And it was so exciting. And then I discovered your work. Wow, it opened my mind as well, right? So you from 2000 and shall we say 10 to 14, is that fair? Uh, you yeah, I arrived, at, in the fall, yeah. I arrived in the fall of 2009. Okay. And, you know, the first few months in a postdoc, you're just kind of getting your bearings. And for me, it was a move from California studying meditation to a drug abuse research center at Johns Hopkins, like the most conservative medical institution in the United States. So it took me a few months to figure out what planet I had landed on. But (laughs) by 2010, I was actually doing something that felt productive. Let's just say that. Okay. And so, fair enough. And then in preparing this interview, I was trying to think like, what are some uh, sort of moments and then we'll work our way up to present day. But I want you to take me back, if you don't mind, take me back to April 15th, 2012, when you died. (laughs) <laughs> would you mind yeah. can you mind reliving that in your head right now is that would that be too is it yeah, too much it's funny the part that's missing is the major current of anxiety that was running through my life because that's part of what died in that whole process yeah. yeah so i have to speak about the fear that i felt in a kind of distant way i can tap into it in little bits and pieces but it used to be kind of always there in the background and before that day I just thought that that's how how I was. I was an anxious person. There are lots of anxious people. Certain things would make it temporarily go away. That's why I meditated. That's why I dabbled in other, you know, psychedelic extracurricular activities. That's why I was such a workaholic. 
And then I met this teacher and he said something to me on this walking path in the middle of a conference. I visited a waterfall and I sat down and I focused on my breath. And the question popped up in my mind, where am I? And as soon as I asked, where am I? Everything just dissolved into this vortex of energy. And it was terrifying because I felt like I was about to get sucked into this vortex of energy that didn't care about humans or life on earth (laughs) or whether I was going to come back. But when I came back into my body, everything was shining and brilliant. And I felt a lot of gratitude for having a body and being alive. And I saw the earth as just this paradise of biological life. So it turns out that that was just the preliminary to death. (laughs) You know, that was just like a little taste. And then a couple days later, I had given this big talk. For me, it was kind of, you know, my first public talk in this arena of talking about psilocybin. And the couple days later, as soon as I stepped on the airplane to go home, that's when I knew I was about to die. Like my foot hit the, you know, the little like transition where you're going down the little runway thing and then you get on the airplane. As soon as my foot went past that threshold, Mm -hmm. I, this thing went through me. I was like, oh, the plane's going to crash. I'm about to die. I knew it. I knew for sure that if I stayed on the plane, I was going to die. And in that moment, getting to my seat, I started panicking. I was like sweating. I was going to come up with some excuse and just like leave, you know, get off the airplane. And something, maybe because of the experience I'd had a few days before, I'm not really sure what kept me on the plane. And it was a total surrender to the moment that Mm. I had no control over. Yeah. And I just meditated on my breath as if each breath was the last breath. And the moment of death was actually kind of anticlimactic. I thought something would happen and it said nothing happened. It was just like a switch flipped. Mm. And I remember opening my eyes and looking out the window and being like, oh, that was it. And so ever since that moment, I mean, there were several months of adjusting to the reality of having died, but still being alive. And then once that all settled down, it was like a big chunk of that fear that I had been living with was gone. But a lot of the other parts of me were still around. The best bits. (laughs) Hopefully the best (laughs) bits. And then, you know, I've been invited to surrender at different points since then. It hasn't ever been so dramatic. But each time I surrender a little bit more and more, that anxiety goes away. I haven't gotten rid of all of it. I'd like to say I have, (laughs) but... So you're still human? I'm still human. (laughs) The aliens haven't come with their mothership to take me off into some distant paradise yet. I don't know if that's waiting for me. How do you know that your body snatched, the body snatchers didn't take you in that moment? How do you know that for sure? Yeah, you know, someone asked me that fairly recently. I was back in December, someone I met in Boulder, Colorado said, you know, I was curious about that death experience. And so I recounted it again. He's like, how do you know you're not dead? I was like, I don't. I guess the virtual reality simulation could still be running quite effectively. <laughs> yeah. I'm not really sure. So the thing that I found interesting about that experience is you described it in your wonderful TEDx talk, which I wish more people watched. I was shocked that it wasn't like 5 billion, you know, listens <laughs> or watches. And so hopefully this uh, psychology podcast can get it out there to a broader audience. But I was thing I found particularly interesting the way you described it is as you felt unreal afterwards for a while which really contrasts with the noetic feeling that William James talked about as these experiences tend to make you feel realer than real. And David Yadin did this wonderful study finding that people after mystic experiences tend to report that the world feels realer than real. So how do you reconcile that with how you described the way you felt right afterwards? Well, I'm curious what... So a lot of my reading and training up until that point was through Buddhist mental training. And in particular, the Tibetan kind of book of living and dying, which talks about these bardos that people can end up in after they die. And so I wonder, you know, for the Tibetans, what they talk about is that there is a period of unreality that happens after death where the soul is temporarily very confused. And the whole point of meditating and training your mind while you're alive is so that at the moment of the death, you're not confused and you're able to transition either to nirvana if you're really lucky, or choose a next life so that it's not just something happening to you. And typically what they say is that when people die, they often just black out. They black out, they have no memory of the transition, and then they're born, and then all of the suffering that they've always had in their whole history, all the different lives, the suffering just continues. And it's pretty pathetic because there's no way out. 
But if you can be aware of the transition and you don't just black out, you have some memory like, oh, I died. This is the bardo. I can't be distracted. I have to pay attention. Then you have some choice over the next life that you create. And perhaps it's because I was primed in that type of philosophy or that type of worldview that I felt like I was in a bardo. And that bardo was full of both fearful and enticing distractions. Mm. And I felt like, oh, I haven't done enough training for this. Like I've done just enough that I didn't black out, right? <laughs> you know, I didn't completely yeah. lose consciousness. That's good. Uh-huh. <laughs> I guess so. But at the time I was like, can't I just have lost consciousness and started over again as a baby? Like, why am I aware of this craziness that I'm in right now? So I do think that that priming had a lot to do with it. Just wanted to take this moment to thank you all for your support of the podcast over the years. It's been a real privilege to do this podcast for you all for over the past three and a half years. If you'd like to further support the podcast, I wanted to let you know a few things you could do to help make this podcast a better experience for you all. First, I'd really appreciate it if you could subscribe to the Psychology Podcast on iTunes. This would help make the show more prominent on iTunes and increase our listenership. I believe you can subscribe both on your iPhone and on your computer. Second, it'd be great if you could give the show a rating and review on iTunes. I definitely read and appreciate all of the reviews. Another thing you can do is donate some money to the show by going to thepsychologypodcast.com and clicking on the link Support the Podcast at the bottom of the page. That's thepsychologypodcast.com. Thanks to the donations we've received so far, we've been able to increase the audio quality substantially, so your donations really do go to helping to make the show a better listening experience. Thanks again for your incredible support of the show over the years. You know, I do this show for you all because I truly love sharing my enthusiasm and love of the mind, brain, and creativity. Okay, now back to the show. Yeah, so I think that you raise a really interesting point about the necessity to help people process the experience and also integrate it into who they are because, you know, yes, a part of you died, but you're still Catherine Queen, like you're still in the same body and your brain didn't fundamentally like reorganize. Maybe it did, but connectivity of the brain can't reorganize like in a second. (laughs) Yeah, I also think the thing worth pointing out too is that And I've seen this in people who have mystical experiences after psychedelics. It's harder for people who are skeptical or like trained in science or atheists to integrate a mystical experience. Mm. And I think for me, that was my primary training as well. Like I dabbled in meditation and psychedelics, but I was primarily a scientist who believed that everything could be known. And like, if you die, you physically are dead. You don't get to keep walking around. And so I think there were two parts of my mind that were battling, you know, the part that knew I had died and the part that was like, no one else really believes this. My scientific colleagues are like, so what, you just like took a drug when you were out in Arizona? I'm like, no, I was sober. This thing happened on an airplane. And they're like, what? And like, so there was a lot of that kind of doubt and like your crazy thing that I had to kind of reconcile. So you'd like Molly on the one hand and was it X-Files? <laughs> who, are the, who are the two right. characters that, that represent yeah. that? Okay, well, I'm trying to reconcile what you experienced with like, you know, the mystical experiences questionnaire that you have, for instance, has one of the facets is positive emotions, right? Mm-hmm. So it seems like once you surrendered fully and accepted it and kind of got shed your scientific baggage, so to speak, Then the world did, things snapped into like what you do tend to find in most people when they have these experiences, right? Like it was, it was ultimately a very positive experience, right? I want to, I want to make that clear. It just took about seven months. Okay. And you know, I was living in Baltimore. I was working at Johns Hopkins. It could have been easier if I just did a full Ram Dass and just said, sorry guys, I'm changing my name. I'm going to live in India. I don't care about being a full outport. Right. (laughs) No, because think about it. That's what he did when he had his Mm -hmm. mystical awakening. He just didn't go back to that life. He just, he literally died. He changed his name. So it could just be also that it's like, well, you know, I went back and I was haunting the life that I was going to leave anyway. So of course it was going to be terrible and uncomfortable until I finally left. You know, it's like they talk about in Tibetan mythology, it's like ghosts go back and haunt their home and their family and their their body even, until the body is all burned up and until the family mm. said, hey, you're dead. You're not part of this anymore. Like, you have to go. And instead, my Hopkins family was like, stay here. Don't die. Don't go away. So it was very confusing, you know? They weren't following the protocol. <laughs> so interesting. <laughs> they weren't following the protocol. Well, you can't blame them. No. <laughs> People love you. You're, you're a lovable person, Catherine. Don't blame yourself for that. 
So the title of your talk, your TEDx talk was Open Wide and Say Aw. I thought that was so yeah. brilliant, first of all. I love that title. I know. And Is it appropriate to use a completely ridiculous pun for a TED talk? <laughs> oh, I think not only is it appropriate, it's very on brand of TED. <laughs> So since then, like there has been this, like you said, yeah, there's been a, just a flurry of research and particularly on potential interventions and ways of using psychedelics responsibly for a wide variety of human suffering, forms of human suffering. Would you mind detailing some of that research? Sure. So when I was at Hopkins, we were still primarily studying healthy volunteers and the kind of the approach from a safety and IRB perspective was that these are still dangerous chemicals, they're illegal, they are abused by the public. We don't know if they're safe, so it's best to keep studying them in healthy people until we get a sense of whether the drug is beneficial or not. And then I think it became pretty obvious that not only was psilocybin relatively safe, but it was actually benefiting people. Even healthy people who didn't have much room to change were changing in a positive direction. Mm. And so Kind of while I was at Hopkins, things started shifting toward a like a kind of a medicalization model. I think all the researchers saw the writing on the wall and they said, you know, if this chemical is ever going to be available to the public, it's probably not going to be legalized outright. It might be legalized in some kind of, you know, narrow fashion, you know, for people with certain conditions. But it's never going to really be available to, except to a privileged elite unless we come up with a diagnosis and start testing whether it can help those people with that diagnosis. Mm. And so, you know, it's kind of what is it, like strategy driven research, you know, and it was always hard for me to kind of manage those two sides. You know, there was the discovery oriented research, what can psychedelics do to the body and mind and brain? And then there was what can psychedelics do practically that would like make the medical establishment change its view on whether this drug is a medicine. And so one of the ways that that was starting to be tested was in cancer patients. And so some of the old research was that uh, both LSD and psilocybin decreased what's called existential distress. Mm. And it's the kind of fear, that real terror that I had on the airplane right before I died. Yeah. And that kind of anxiety is not touched by benzodiazepines. It's not touched by psychotherapy. Well, Irvin Yalom's form of psychotherapy, it's touched by. Oh, interesting. Existential psychotherapy. is this. Well, right. What well, yeah, but when people are in an ICU and they're getting, you know, 10 minutes with a psychiatrist once a day, it's not really going to. Oh, no, you're, oh, yeah. you're totally right. I mean, it's not mainstream, but I yeah. mean, if Yalm had his way, it would be mainstream. Yeah. Right. So let's just say if you haven't been training your whole life yeah. to prepare for existential distress, you're going to be completely sideswiped by it. Yeah. And when you find yourself in a doctor's office or an ICU, you're going to have these experiences where you're lonely, you're terrified, you're in a lot of pain. And the only drug right now that helps with that is morphine. And people just end up being sedated into death. And so that's amazing pain relief. It's amazing, you know, psychic pain relief, but it doesn't really do much for people who want to be present for those moments. And so, you know, the old research suggested that LSD could reduce physical and psychic pain for terminal patients or people in an ICU environment. And both NYU and Hopkins decided to run kind of parallel cancer studies based on a preliminary study done at Harbor UCLA by Charlie Grobe and Alicia Danforth, showing that psilocybin reduced this kind of anxiety in cancer patients. So kind of fast forward, NYU and Hopkins both found amazing results for psilocybin when given to people who were facing cancer. And at the same time, they kind of learned along the way that the FDA said, well, existential distress isn't a diagnosis. You're never going to get a new drug prescribed for existential distress, which is hilarious because that's like the main thing that we're all dealing with. They're like, no, sorry, that's not a condition. <laughs> it's not a health condition that we recognize. And so then the kind of shift was toward depression. And now all of a sudden you hear everyone talking about psilocybin for major depression. And that's kind of like where I start to get a little bit skeptical. It seems like we've moved away from the inherently what does this drug seem to do for people, which is reduce kind of existential or kind of mm -hmm. purpose, life meaning, spiritual d distress or anxiety to like, oh, maybe it just reduces depression and anxiety of any form. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of one path that has been developing. The other path is MDMA for trauma, which is its own kind of category, but it's the MDMA is the ecstasy chemical basically, but in its pure form. And those 
kind of set of trials are way more directed and specific and extremely effective for severe PTSD. And so, you know, MDMA is less a strategy for PTSD. You know, it's not a strategy for legalizing MDMA. It actually really works for people who've had untreatable PTSD. Amazing. Yeah. And it's also amazing that it's at phase three. That's pretty high. Well, right. So, I mean, you know, when Rick Doblin founded this nonprofit called MAPS 25 years ago, he founded it to make MDMA a prescribable medicine, but not because he just wanted MDMA to be legal, but because it had already been shown to be so effective for trauma and for couples therapy and for various other forms of therapy. And so we're at phase three now because there's been 25 years of kind of tedious, slow, careful progress. And if you contrast that to the phase three, the proposed phase three trials of psilocybin for depression, it feels very different to me. It feels like one is very calculated and careful and really targeting the thing that the drug is good for. And with psilocybin for depression, it feels like it's just, let's see if this peg fits in this hole. Mm. Like we've got this problem of depression and we want to see if this drug f- solves that problem. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical of jumping too far ahead. Well, I appreciate that skepticism, especially for something so potentially important. You want to get it, do it right. So that, that's admirable. I'm trying to understand because I didn't know that like ecstasy was considered a psychedelic. Is it in that class? Like, does it actually, it doesn't cause sort of hallucinations, does it? Well, it's an interesting question. Michael Pollan, you know, said right up front in his new book that everyone's raving about that MDMA just categorically is not a psychedelic. But if you ask different people and different researchers, you get different answers. And so for some individuals, MDMA is a classic psychedelic Hmm. in terms of their subjective experience. It certainly has slightly different chemical action in the brain, and it's not typically categorized along with LSD, psilocybin, ayahuasca, DMT, mescaline. Those are kind of the classic psychedelics. But if you ask, so there's this kind of underground chemist named Sasha Shulgin. And if you asked him, basically, underground, well, he had a DEA license to develop new chemicals in a lab that he was running in California, like a tiny like hermit, you know, right behind his house with his wife. Hmm. And what he was actually doing with that lab is coming up with new psychedelics every day and trying them out. (laughs) I see. I see. So he came up with thousands of variations on LSD, DMT. So he would take the kind of core chemical that was known and try to come up with something better. And at the end of the day, he didn't really come up with anything better. And MDMA, he didn't discover it, but he came up with a very fast way of creating it. And he always said that MDMA was like this miracle chemical that nothing was better than. And I'm kind of like very much paraphrasing because obviously he had appreciation for lots of chemicals, but There were very few chemicals that he tried and worked with and was like, we should be using this instead of the ones that are available. And MDMA was one of them. And so it seems to me from my own experience, from reading the research, I mean, there's an 80% remission rate at one year in people who've never successfully been treated for PTSD. So they get a few doses of MDMA along with psychotherapy. And then a year later, 80% of them are still PTSD free. And so it's like, This is a disease that's untouchable. The average, I think, the average amount of suffering was something on the order of almost 20 years that people had severe PTSD without any relief and had tried all of these other, you know, therapies and and chemicals and and yet this kind of unassuming serotonin drug, MDMA, that isn't fully psychedelic, so it's actually not as scary as some of the classic ones. Unless you find love scary. (laughs) I guess so. The feeling of too much love. (laughs) Right. So yeah, some people call it an intactogen, an empathogen, mm-hmm. you know, a, giving rise to sensations of empathy. But yeah, it can be, you know, I kind of, I consider it a psychedelic because I think at the end of the day, it opens people up in a similar way. But how do psychopaths feel when they take MDMA? That is a great question. I don't know if anyone's done that study yet. <laughs> Someone should really do that stuff, like go into a prison, high level security prison, those who like committed the most horrific murders and give them MDMA and like measure their, I don't know, various markers of empathy. I don't know how you do What was that study they did with sociopaths? It was like an empathy brain imaging study. And it was like training people to be more able to identify emotions in facial expressions. Mm. And the sociopaths were like, now I know better how to mimic emotions. Yeah. 
Yeah, I know. Like, <laughs> so <laughs> that's cognitive empathy, not effective empathy. But yeah. we would want to see whether or not the MDMA really actually changes their mirror neuron structure. You know. I mean, I do know. You know, it's an interesting question. I think if if you had to pick one drug to give to someone who's an actual sociopath or psychopath or mm. even just like a full blown narcissist, MDMA would probably be the safest one to start with because you're not going to really trigger a ton of those ego defenses, you know, that like, yeah. oh, I'm starting to blend with everything around me and that's scary. And so I'm just going to shut down. Absolutely. And I'm thinking because a lot of psychopaths are known in the literature to lack serotonin. Like it's mm-hmm. like it's almost non-existent in a way. So, I mean, the results are obviously more complex than that. And any scientist listening to this will give me a thousand caveats, but it's just interesting to think of what that can do. And also think about the brain, and I know that's not a topic that, you know, you're skeptical as well about some of the brain research, but I'm really interested. I'm just I'm curious, I'm ravenously curious about what is the mechanism that explains this amazing effect. And mm-hmm. it seems like all roads keep coming back to the default mode network. And I have been critical myself of how that research has been represented in that literature because I've spent my not my entire career, but a good chunk of my career studying the default mode network is a wonderfully positive thing related to creativity. And here I'm reading all these, you know, Pollen's whole last chapters about how, you know, like the hero of the story was like the quieting of the default network. (laughs) And that kind of was like a stab to my chest because I feel like it's such a gross oversimplification of very, very broad, complex brain network that has many components to it. And do you know what I mean? And to kind of just say like, that's what cured me. I saw enlightenment because the default mode network is important for perspective taking. It's important for compassion. You know, it doesn't make sense to me to say like, we've cinched the deal, you know, cinched it once we've learned how to uh, use our executive network to suppress it. So, I think things are much more complex than that. No, and I think, you know, I was temporarily kind of in that default mode honeymoon phase when Judd Brewer published his finding that long-term meditators were able to kind of quiet their default mode network. Yeah. And then Robin Carhart Harris in London published the psilocybin finding. And it was like the same exact brain regions, same pattern. But then I was like, well, that's the beginning. And so then how do we bring the tools of neuroscience to bear on this question that it's like, we found a pattern. Now, what does that pattern mean? And my skepticism is more, have we actually done that? You know, I mean, to have one or two labs in the entire world trying to tackle this question is ludicrous. Like mm. tons of neuroscientists should be involved. We should be yeah. bringing in, you know, like people like you and Jonathan Schooler who study creativity. Jonathan Schooler actually reached out to me and said, I'd love to start studying psilocybin and creativity. And then his university is like, well, we're not a medical school and we're not mm. taking the risk. We funded his research in the Imagination Institute. But yeah, I guess and, it didn't include psychedelics. Yeah. No. And so there's a whole field of understanding that in my view, having been trained in psychology, is actually a lot more nuanced and theoretically driven than drug abuse research. And those psychologists aren't allowed to tackle these questions because they're not in medical schools. They're not trained to kind of have pharmacies that manage schedule one drugs. And so I think like we're at a point where the psychedelic researchers need to step out of their little drug abuse, you know, cocoon and start asking for help from actual experts in other fields and be like, We have these big basic findings, but we don't have the training or the way of thinking about the brain and the mind that you do. And so what does your field say about this pattern? And like, what else should we be testing? What outcome measures? What ways of probing the brain? Not just if the whole default mode basically quiets during a peak psychedelic experience, that's fine. But like, what about at the end of the psychedelic experience or the next morning or like a week later? Exactly. If you walked around with a quiet a fully quiet default mode network, you would actually have very, very low compassion because you would not be able to take the perspective of anyone else other than yourself. Well, that's not entirely true. I want to stop you there because you just described a bunch of Zen masters I know. (laughs) (laughs) Not a bunch, but I think that's been a problem, right? It's like, well, people try to keep up that peak experience and then they end up being assholes. They totally become assholes (laughs) or can be. And this is a really important point about enlightened assholes, let's call them, because (laughs) you can start feeling superior to others after these experiences because you feel like, wow, I've reached this level of pure oneness that all these chumps haven't reached yet, you know, like, and you can become a maniacal guru. And 
that can happen. <laughs> it's not like, you know, like we're allowed to like question that and say like, just because you're a guru, you're allowed to question whether or not you're doing good as a guru, right? Yeah. And you've got that going on with psychedelics too. You have the kind of same narcissistic shamans, you know, they are kind of permanently in this because they're taking psychedelics so frequently, they're kind of permanently in this frame of reality where they are at the center and everything else is kind of a projection of that self. And so it's like, it's certainly a stage along the path to enlightenment. But as a a good friend told me, he's like, if you see a signpost and you're like, oh, I've got to this point on the path, you don't like hang out at that rest stop. You like stay there for a little while and then you keep going. I think for a lot of people, once they've gotten beyond that initial fear of selfishness yeah. and then their self becomes so big, then the fear goes away. But it's like, no, there's something even beyond that that's even scarier to give up. And that's you being at the center of anything. <laughs> yeah. I'm now wondering if you put psychopaths on this stuff, do they become even more psychopaths? <laughs> Maybe. I mean, we've seen that in the psychedelic community, unfortunately. <laughs> so actually it might have the opposite effect. That's actually it, like it might just amplify whatever you are. That's another interesting hypothesis. We can formulate lots of hypotheses about what's possible. There certainly needs to be more research about it. Something that does seem to be going on with the MDMA post-traumatic stress disorder link that I want to say in linking it to the default mode network that I think is probably very, very valid. There is a part of the default mode network that is associated with rumination, you know, medial prefrontal cortex. There are certain areas that you can get stuck in, you can rummage around in your medial prefrontal cortex in a negative way. And that could be associated, that's associated with neuroticism, the personality trait neuroticism. But the most interesting thing is not just the default mode network or even one part of the default mode network. It's the interactions between multiple large scale networks. So the action is really in how much is your executive attention network regulating the default mode network? That's the important question. The question isn't, have you quieted your default mode network as it's being pitched in the psychedelic literature and the meditation literature. So John Kabat-Zinn writes about this all the time as well, and I think it's such an oversimplification. The real question is, how much have you trained through meditation practices your executive network to be able to regulate your attention so that you can use your default mode network when you want to have empathy and compassion for others and imagination and creativity, and you can suppress it when you're ruminating too much. I think that's the level of nuance that the field needs to right. have. Right. Yeah. It's like cognitive flexibility yeah, and yeah, that's right. emotional resilience. Like when Mathieu Ricard was asked by Tanya Singer in a study to generate empathy for people who are suffering, he said, it's unbearable. I can't do this. I'm feeling so much pain right now. Right. And she said, well, can you generate compassion? He said, I could do that forever. Yeah. And so it's like, he could do the thing that was unpleasant and give feedback about like, oh no, I just tried to do that. I have, you know, control over that mental faculty and I'm not going to do that anymore because it's causing me a lot of suffering. Exactly. So give me a new task to do. And I think, you know, I think with the psychedelic community, I've seen that kind of cognitive flexibility in people who really maybe are open to begin with, become more open, but then don't just hang out in that fantasy world. They actually figure out practically, ethically, like, what should I do with this openness? What should I, where should I be putting my efforts? And I think with, you know, people who are suffering, like with PTSD or depression, just giving them a little bit of a boost in openness isn't going to do it. It's like they need the framework after the experience to know how to act differently in the world, how to think differently every day. I mean, because otherwise you're just talking about another form of morphine, but instead of for the body, it's like for our ruminative minds. It's like Mm -hmm. we give our ruminative minds this break and it feels great. And then of course that mind comes back unless you figure out a way to live differently. And so, you know, Pollen talks about, you know, losing his ego. That's, you know, Robin's big thing is ego dissolution. So in a culture where ego is so problematic, Mm -hmm. like we've created selves that are so anxiety ridden, so selfish, so fearful that of course, just obliterating that for a moment feels amazing. But like maybe there's a different form of self that needs to be created in the aftermath that is a healthy ego. That's like a healthy form of using, like you're saying, all these normal faculties. And we don't want to just create zombies who feel good. It's like we want to (laughs) create people who are actually helping the planet and helping each other. So That's funny that you used, um, beautiful, I love everything you're saying, first of all, that's funny you used the word zombies because I got a little bit of heat for a uh, big think talk that I gave, uh, uh-huh. you know, you know, the big think thing, you yeah. know, and I gave a little thing where I said, 
I said, have you ever been to these mindfulness like conferences? You look at the room, they all look like zombies. Like, I don't think they're like that creative in that moment. I've gone to a lot of Zen retreats and at the end of the day, the insights that I have brought into my life are because I decided to be creative about the process right. in my own mind rather than just follow what the teacher was saying. Yeah. And, you know, my husband always gives me a hard time. I'll like come back from a retreat and be like, this is like what happened during the interview. And he's like, why do you sit in an interview with someone who's so much more trained than you and not just like listen to them? You're like challenging them. You're like being confrontational. You're getting angry. I'm like, cause I'm only there for seven days. I like really want to find out what the F is going on. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's great. I mean, you're a great example of what I think there needs to be more of in science among scientists is this balance of the spiritual, experiential uh, openness and the intellectual curiosity. Is that why we bonded? <laughs> Probably. Didn't we like instantly bond? <laughs> yeah. No. And I think there's, you know, it's that old saying of like drinking the Kool-Aid. I think unfortunately mm. it happened in mindfulness. And actually I think the most successful people in that meditation research world have graduated from that initial period of just mindfulness is good for everything. Yeah. And I know a lot of people who are, you know, asking the tough questions now, but in the psychedelic research world, it's like, Everyone would rather keep drinking the Kool-Aid of like, yeah. let's just keep showing how this is good for people and not really talking about how it's bad because that scares people. And like, it's just like eyes on the prize. Let's get something legalized or made into a medicine. And that's not even the most interesting question to me. It's like, we should be as critical about the psychedelic findings as anything. Otherwise, it's like, what's the long-term goal for this area of science? I mean, so we end up with a new drug. Who cares? Yeah. You're raising really, really, truly important points. You know, we both have those hats. Like we could spend an hour talking about how much we love drugs and meditation because we both do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I don't want to speak for you. And I haven't done that many drugs, I should say. But meditation, I particularly really helped. I did an eight week MBSR course mm -hmm. and it really helped me with my generalized anxiety disorder. So I can clearly see the benefit of that. But here's the thing, and I, I know that you agree with this. A fully integrated human being, a fully functioning human in Carl Rogers' sense or, or self-actualization in Maslow's sense is not simply a reduction of anxiety. It's not like an integration. A fully integrated person is one where you have all of your selves are harmoniously integrated, but you don't like neglect any of those selves. You don't like treat the neuroticism you used to have as the redheaded stepchild. <laughs> I never put it that way before, but I'm saying, you don't say like, okay, we're going to like banish them. You know, I used meditation so I can now banish that to this <laughs> attic. I don't know why I'm using this metaphor, but that's still, you know, that was a big part of who I was. And in certain instances, it, it can actually be beneficial to have that. There are things I want to be fearful of in life. There are things I want to be anxious about. You know, I want to be able to have a metacognitive view of it and take it as, as wisdom and perspective. But, you know, some of that is part of wisdom is keeping some of that anxiety. What do you think of what no, I just definitely. said? Is any of that, I mean, am I making any sense at all? No, absolutely. And I, you know, I had this conversation with, it's, it was actually a really uh, funny moment. So I was dropping my husband off at silent retreat and our daughter came with us. She's, she was two and a half at the time. She's almost three. So it's like prime survival years. Like you're just the, whatever anxiety I used to have about myself. And most mm. of it was just fantasy or like nightmare. <laughs> now it's actually directed to like, is my child alive moment to moment? <laughs> like, am I about to like make some mistake in vigilance or emotion regulation that's going to cause her harm? So this is a totally different category, but like, I'm so happy I have that form of anxiety. So we go up to this Buddha center. I have this amazing sit, you know, I'm like, oh, so stable, no fear, completely at ease, loving, blah, blah, blah. And then later that night, she gets hives all over her body and we have to go to the ER because we're in the middle of nowhere. And like exactly. none of the, like, because no one else there has kids, the residents are just like, oh, well, you know, is this really a big deal? I'm like, yes, it's a big yes. deal. It's only two and a half. And like, we don't know why she's, you know, so I'm like panicking. And if someone said to you in that moment, just meditate, uh, wouldn't you want to slap them? Well, right. That, so I was kind of getting more and more escalated because I was just like, somebody should be panicking with me. Like, this yes, is the moment. Yes. So the next day I asked the Buddhist teacher, I'm like, you know, that fear that I felt on the plane that I thought I made so much progress in understanding and just the tiniest shift in circumstances and that all that terror comes back, I'm panicking. And he said, well, 
but you still made the right decision. It's like you didn't forget how to make decisions. Like that emotion was causing you to be vigilant enough to make this decision that could have been life or death. Mm -hmm. And I said, I guess I just thought that all of this meditation eventually, like I would stop feeling that panic. And he's like, no, the point is actually that in those moments of panic, you can just let go and surrender into what is happening and just do what needs to be done. And sometimes that means taking charge. And sometimes it means somebody else has to do this because I can't do it. But it's not like you're going to be like perfectly adjusted to every possible scenario. And like, you know, like Jesus being nailed to the cross and be like, I'm fine with this, you know, total equanimity. <laughs> I think that I really like that distinction. I like that a lot. Cool. So, so many exciting things I want to talk to you about that. And I want to be respectful of your time. And so, you know, maybe you could tell me some of your more recent research or like follow-ups. Like, can we talk about this seven-year follow-up you, you, you did? Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I'm so grateful to the team of people that I worked with when I was a grad student because, so Cliff Saren had this amazing vision to study Western meditators as if they were, you know, mm. monastics in India. He was inspired by a trip to India. He connected up with Alan Wallace, who was the meditation teacher. They wanted to study people for a year. And all of the funders were like, mm, we could maybe do a month. And so they compromised at a three-month retreat. We collected tons of data over that three months. And then and the really brilliant thing was to keep following people up. The five-month follow-up, then a year and a half. And then seven years later, we sent everybody laptops and questionnaires. And we found out, like, what do people look like seven years after doing this really life-changing thing, meditating for three months straight? And I can't really take credit for any of the vision around the seven-year follow-up because, you know, it's like I was gone in, you know, a few months after I started my postdoc. My brain was just like, you know, you like dump out one part of your brain that used to study EEG and you start studying mm -hmm. drugs instead. And now I've dumped up downtown, like both of those parts of my brain and I become a mom and I'm like around mm -hmm. psychedelic people all the time. So <laughs> that kind of plasticity, it's just like it's really hard to maintain that kind of persistence in academia to get kind of follow up like that. Totally. And so Tony Zanesco and, and Brandon King were the two grad students who kind of carried the torch for that follow up. And we just published uh, that basically after seven years, the amount of change that people got better out of response inhibition task, you press a button every time you see a long line and then you withhold the button press when you see a short line that people got better at that within the first month and a half, two months of meditation. And seven years later, they're still just as good at that. I'm going to say stupid task. You know, it's like when I came up with this task, I'm like, oh, it's just a measure of response inhibition. Who cares? But it predicts success and happiness in all sorts of different domains of life. And they're still good at it seven years later. And they're not practicing this task. You know, they're just living their lives. And the kind of the other cool finding is that there's a certain amount of cognitive decline in controlling your responses. So you're less good at response inhibition as you age. And the more you meditate in that seven-year follow-up, the less you show that cognitive decline on the task. And so it's like, oh, you know, if you, you invest that really intense time of training, it may not have to be three months. You know, we saw the benefits after only about a month and a half. Mm. Then if you keep up a regular practice, your brain has changed basically permanently, so that then you get a laptop in the mail, you do this little task, and you're just as good at it as when you're in a monastic environment, basically. And on top of that, all these questionnaire measures, I mean, you can kind of debate the questionnaire measures because, you know, once you've filled out questionnaires a bunch of times, you kind of know, you maybe remember what your answers are. But let's just assume people are being honest and that they're not just kind of generating the answers that they think we want. The changes in personality, the changes in well-being, the changes in kind of mindfulness and resilience and empathy, all of those are still there at seven years as well. Dang. And some of them have dropped off. But yeah, we called it adaptive functioning because kind of all of these adaptive say. psychological measures increase with meditation and they're still hanging out at this high level seven years later. Some people in the literature have written that like personality is cast in stone after 30 years of life, after your first 30 years of life, and or that it tends to be relatively stable, I should say. But there are lots of, like therapy has been shown in this great, Ben Roberts did this review paper showing there are methods that really show substantial personality change, like CBT, certain forms of therapy. And it looks like we can add meditation to this list of something that could cause long-lasting personality change. So that's great. Well, right. So Colin DeYoung is, 
Oh, that's another my homeboy. Kind of, I know. He's another like openness obsessed person. And he's also <laughs> obsessed with destroying the myth of stable personality. He's like, yeah. Yeah. So we talk about that a lot and how, you know, Colin. Yeah, I know. I mean, I've never met him in person, but I know him in the age of, you know, virtually knowing people through all sorts of funny, you know, social media. It's so funny. um, He's my biggest collaborator on openness. Yeah. And he and I wanted to write a review on openness and psychedelics. And just because I couldn't get my ish together because I don't (laughs) in academia anymore. I'm like, Uh, I'm clearly not writing this. Like, uh, It's never going to happen. But other people kind of stepped up. So other labs have been doing more openness research and writing the reviews that I wanted to write. So that's great. I like love it when, you know, I have a good idea and someone else does it now. <laughs> well, that's your ego dissolution talking. <laughs> and also just like enjoying life talking. It's like, well, yeah, here's no, a good idea that should help people it. and can it. someone else do it. <laughs> but um, no, Colin and I were talking about how it is still unusual that you could change personality so dramatically in like generally stable, healthy people, mm. either overnight with a chemical like psilocybin or over the course of a month and a half with meditation. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, if you go through a divorce or if you go through like a major life event, your personality might change. If you're super depressed and then you get cured, your neuroticism will go down, you know, your extroversion will go up. But openness is not typically one of those things that seems to increase randomly after people have life experiences. And yet it's been this reliable finding in the psychedelic literature. The cool finding with the, you know, even though I'm skeptical about the depression trials, Mm -hmm. in the trial, in an open label trial with depressed volunteers, their openness increased and the amount of increase in openness was related to the decrease in depression symptoms. And so in that paper that I was just one of the co-authors, Dave Arizzo was the lead author from London. He basically said, you know, neuroticism going down and extroversion going up in depressed people when they're not depressed is kind of a typical finding. But you don't really see openness all the time going up. Mm. And so it does seem like whatever's going on with openness, whatever that indicates, is something that we should be tackling more head on and trying to understand what does this self-reported openness mean? you know, in people's lives, how long does it last? In the Hopkins study that I did, it lasted 14 months. You know, with depressed individuals, maybe it kind of goes back to baseline after, you know, their symptoms come back. In the MDMA trial, it lasted for years. So again, these like long-term follow-ups that, you know, these are not just, I feel better for a few weeks. Absolutely. It's exciting. David Yade and I recently created an all-experience scale, which I can't wait to share with you. All experience? Yeah. Yeah. That has like six facets of it so people can like know is what I had oh, is at all. Yeah, yeah. All experience, like the theory of everything scale. It's like it's a measure that measures everything. Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> That's my next project. But yeah, the number one predictor of the all experience. I have trouble saying I don't know how to say all without saying all because I'm from <laughs> Philly. But yeah, the all experience is, you know, number one personality predictor is openness to experience. It's just that, you know, there's openness to me in it, which has fascinated me. It's the one that is most consistently correlated with a wide range of self-transcendent experiences. Like, flow. Well, how does the term, where does the yeah. term wonder fit? Yeah. I think of wonder a lot when I think of these experiences people have on psychedelics that, you know, may not be religious experiences. No, it's but all. It's a sense of a wonder where it feels nice to be small or part of than a larger whole and yeah. you no longer need to be kind of like at the center of everything. That's part of the the all experience, the all yeah. experience <laughs> for sure. But it seems like openness is the trait like preps people for that. Like it, it like you know, it's like both a precursor and a postcursor. I don't know, is it a postcursor a word? But um mm-hmm. it's something that can make it more likely that you'll get into the experiences, but also it's something that these experiences affect as well. So yeah. it, it's a pretty fascinating thing. And a lot of it seems to me to be about absorption. It's about absorption. It's about shifting your perspective so that you are as fully absorbed in the moment as possible. And that seems to be kind of the key thing going on there. Yeah. I had a friend who actually studies, she's one of the researchers who studies MDMA in cancer patients and in autistic adults. She's a brilliant researcher. And when she came to my farm, and I took her back into the woods. She's like, I'm having a beauty attack. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you know, and she's like, this is this is what happens to me because I'm so open. I'm so empathic. Like things just flow in. And she's like, if it's such a beautiful experience, I like can't even filter to think about, oh, this is a beautiful experience I'm having. It's just like overwhelming. 
<laughs> oh my god! Can I use that? In, in. Can I use that in my in my book? <laughs> That'd be a great like subsection hang from anxiety attack to beauty attack. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's just wonderful. Look, I'm real admirer of what you're doing, and I support your transition from researcher to healer. And <laughs> I um I want to tell listeners two websites: one to go to www.psychedelicprogram.com which is all about, quote, raising awareness and reducing risks of psychedelics through education, psychotherapy, and community. And also your personal website, www.catherinemclean, K-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E-M-A-C-L-E-A-N.org, um, which is what you're all about is, quote, psychedelic integration, meditation, training, and more. <laughs> I love the exclamation point. It's something I would do. <laughs> I know, right? I was like, the more is actually the bigger part of it. But I was like, there, there are more. great terms for that more that I do. I was like, what is it that I do anyway? But that and more is, you know, a lot. <laughs> so you help with individual psychotherapy, group psychotherapy, evaluation, consultation. You help people integrate. Could you end this podcast day by just talking a little bit about what your vision of real true psychedelic integration looks like? Mm. Well, I have to say, I the thing that I've been most inspired by is the work that this group is doing down in Jamaica, which is one of the only countries in the world where mushrooms are legal. Mm. And it's kind of because everything is legal in Jamaica. And so there are kind of pros and cons to a completely deregulated country. But once uh -huh. you get down to this, you know, remote part of Jamaica and Treasure Beach, it's a very open kind of progressive, welcoming culture and mushrooms go wild there. And this guy, Eric Osborne, started a pretty humble enterprise where people come down mostly from the States and from Europe. And they partake in mushroom experiences and then they go home. And several months ago, I was invited down there as a guest to give a talk about my research. And I saw, you know, a group of 20 people having an extremely high dose experience with almost no anxiety, none of the paranoia like freak outs that I saw at Hopkins. And instead, they kind of came out of this with a really deep sense of community, of, you know, empowerment in themselves. And then you know, they go home into their lives and there's a bit of a vacation effect. So the, the effect doesn't maybe last. But I'm kind of curious to understand how those kind of community mushroom experiences could rival the clinical model that I was trained in. Because I was just shocked at how, how high the doses were and how much people were not scared about what was happening to them. And some of these people had never taken psychedelics before or maybe just a handful of times, certainly not at those high doses. We just did a women's retreat there in March. Same thing, you know, this amazing camaraderie and community. And so I'm beginning to think that if there is a key to integration, it's that sense of community and like, who is your tribe? And so you can have a peak experience, you know, you can fill out questionnaires, you can, you know, have a reduction in certain symptoms. But ultimately, after people go home, they're not talking about the mushrooms, they're talking about the people they met. And I think the same thing could happen in meditation. It's not the technique that you're doing, you know, you, you're not just going to beat yourself up every morning sitting in front of an altar, you know, being like, why am I not enlightened yet? It's like, go out into the world and like find the people who make you feel like, you know, you're here for a reason and your life has meaning. And so I think, you know, the, whether the clinical models end up being effective or not, I think we have to address this issue of community. And when people have peak experiences, figure out a way for them to give back almost immediately. And so one project that I was super proud of is I call I started this thing called Psychedelic Good Samaritan Training, where basically it's like you take the experience you have and then figure out how to start helping others, like right away. Not once you're perfected. Just like assume that you're not never going to get perfected. <laughs> you know, you're always going to be who you are. But you can start helping other people. And because you've had a psychedelic experience, maybe you're like more comfortable in environments where most people don't want to go, like soup kitchens or refugee camps or hospice or nursing homes, which are like hell on earth for a lot of people. You know, the people who work there are stressed out. The people who are living there have dementia. They're very sick. No one wants to go volunteer there. It's really hard. But like maybe the psychedelic experience is so opening that you're like, I'll go in there. Like I can bring some creativity and love into this place. And so we had a group of people in Brooklyn actually do that for a month. And it was really, really fun. And so kind of that's my those are my kind of two perspectives now is like, how can we use these peak experiences to help people create community that's healthy and also be like better human beings, like actually in action in the world, not just figuring out how to be a little bit less anxious. I love that. It sounds to me like in Buddha terms, that's we're a proponent of the bodhisattva path. 
Yes, absolutely. To psychedelic experience. And I just want to end there and say thanks again for the great work you're doing to make the world a better place. You are welcome. Thanks for listening to the Psychology Podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com. That's thepsychologypodcast.com. Also, please add a rating and review of the Psychology Podcast on iTunes. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the podcast, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity. 